So winning, leg, winning might actually take longer, but losing is very fast. And, and to some extent, winning involves avoiding losing, which means you want to avoid the traps. And what happens, and what happens essentially, is because of the way I wrote the evaluation function, remember, if it's a terminal node, you take its true value. Otherwise, you take this made up value. So as you are expanding the tree, if you do see traps, they improve the backed up values significantly. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this actually happens pretty much across all interesting games. And people back when this stuff was being done, people actually showed A, that there are pathological games that you can make where going deeper worsens your chance of winning. Because it has no traps. Because it has no traps. And without traps, basically, this thing is just adding noise to noise. You see what I'm saying? And furthermore, so the guy who did this game tree pathology is a guy called Leonard Now, who was on my thesis committee. And then a guy called Judah Pearl, who seems to be ever fresh because he's still hanging around doing great work. How many of you have heard the name Judah Pearl? Okay. Um, in fact, is, is very, very relevant to all the work that's going on in the AI right now. In fact, this issue of causation versus correlation that I mentioned in the beginning, he is pretty much the only guy who's been spending his lifetime looking into what is the best way of figuring out what is causal versus correlational, uh, correlational uh, pro, uh, an artifact. In fact, um, there is a book called The Book of Why. should get yourself a copy of it and read it. It's you know, written for you know, lay public, of his own intellect. It's probably, it's probably oxymoronic to say, but you know, that's what he wrote it for. And it's a beautiful book. It's worthwhile reading that. Okay. But anyway, Peter Pearl is like done. <laughs> he's done a lot of work on um, heuristics. Then he has done a lot of work on the game trees. And in particular, he showed that if you can assume that there are traps at a, you know, distributed in the search space, then you can prove that going deeper necessarily increases the quality. By the way, this entire argument, most people just assume AI ah, deeper will help. And so, in a way, in true to AI, people don't think about this at all. So it's unfortunate for you that you have to think about it because I'm telling you. <laughs> OK. Uh, it would have been so much easier to say, it works. Why do you care? You know, it works because most interesting games have traps. In trying to live long and be happy, you have to avoid getting run over by various trucks on Mill Avenue. Those are obvious traps. If you don't look ahead, that's exactly what will happen to you. You see what I'm saying? Real world is full of traps. Okay, and that's what makes it interesting. Um, so that's the real reason. This is the reason why deeper is better. And in its, this is one of these quote unquote highly funny deep ideas. Because most people who have done intro to AI, most people who think they understand game tree search don't understand this. And here's one more thing I'll tell you. Uh, when we get to it, it will become clearer. Um, when you do MCT, Monte Carlo tree search, the difference in Monte Carlo tree search versus this normal kind of depth limited min max search is Monte Carlo tree search makes a probe, a single probe starting from max. So I'll do this, then the opponent will do this, then I'll do this, then opponent will do this, then I'll do this, then opponent will do this, then I'll do this, until it reaches a terminal node. Notice that it's just looking at one probe. It's a one randomized probe. Okay? And then since it reached the terminal node, it notes the value. 
and then it keeps track of these and it <coughs> propagates these terminal node values up the tree. My discussion about min-maxes and evaluation function assume that you are applying evaluation function at the leaf nodes, which has no reason to be any more accurate at the leaf nodes as again as at the top nodes. But the terminal nodes, that's ground truth. <coughs> so this problem doesn't occur for MCT. Of course, that still explains that requires you to understand what MCT does. We'll get to that at some point. Okay? Questions? Yes. So it's like going deeper, like allows the agent to recognize more traps than the tree. Doesn't that mean does that mean the min agent has an advantage over a max agent? No, both have the same advantage. It depends on how far you are looking. It's like both of you know the same amount of information about the game. These are perfect information games. The main guy doesn't know anything more than you know, other than what they think. Okay? Think traps. That's what makes evaluation functions applied at a deeper node more effective. It's like the strangest thing. The stuff that you're doing at the 15th level is just as accurate as the done what you did at the first level. But it's these traps which will change the valuation. Because you're taking mins and maxes. Yes, sir. Um, so is it enough to go deeper than the opponent? Yeah, yeah, if you have a deep, you know, opponent who kind of makes a pack with you. Think, don't worry. What's your name? Ayan. Ayan, don't worry, Ayan. I'm just going to really throw this game. Imagine I'm only going to do one play. <laughs> then you will just say, I won't even look there. Because I want to play fair. And then you lose. <laughs> Whoever believes the opponents. You're right, but who ever believes the opponents? But like, what is the you find that the opponent made a move and No, 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 again, please understand. Don't compare, don't. remember when all of this is going on. This is still in your head. Opponent still hasn't even made their move. You are thinking, if I make this move, you get to make these moves, then I get to make this move, then I get to make this, you get to make these moves. Of all the you know, depth 15 moves in the depth 15 tree, what does depth 15 tree tell me about the top moves that I'm supposed to do? And the min guy is going to do exactly the same thing. You see? Any other questions? That's what we've been talking about. I mean, that, the move or the thinking? No, that's called lightning chess, right? Yes. So basically the time that you have to think is less, which is the whole reason we talked about any time computation. So you could always make a move just by applying evaluation function to the top three nodes. You don't have to do any search at all. It's just that you lose more often. If you don't believe that Kaspero loses more games in, when he is playing lightning chess, again, there's other people who don't have to play lightning chess. Which is the way this game is, right? I mean, it's like, if you as well as Casper are playing lightning chess, what's the point? You know, you know this stuff, right? I don't know how many of you are chess beeps. So like, the only way, yeah, so there are people. So the only way chess people make any money, because, you know, footballers make the rest of the money, um, <laughs> is they'll go to some random, um, like a mall or something, they'll put huge number of bozos like us. You know, we'll all be there, we get our full brain, all thinking powers. And then they just be walking around and... <laughs> and by the end of the day, they will win most of the games. Either that or they will never be a next mall. Because nobody will play. Because if Gary Kospro is losing all the matches in the lightning match, <laughs> you forget about it, you go see a football game. Okay? And so in that case, you do realize that when Opponents don't have constraints, and you put a time constraint, you lose more often. That's just the way it is. Okay? But I mean, notice the beautiful trade-offs that games bring in. To some extent, they bring in the fact that, that there's only one clock. When you're thinking and when you're doing, it's all the same clock. And that's basically what online computation is. Okay. Um, 
Disney father is already. Uh, it doesn't matter. Right? So this whole thing I actually discussed all of this. The whole idea of this kind of depth cut off searches, they're called online searches. In some sense, you're making decisions during the time when you have to make that decision without having seen all the way to the end. And online searches, unlike A star search, which figures out the optimal full solution and makes the first move on that solution. So you can't ever be wrong. Online searches can be wrong. In fact, there is this whole question of online search is not only not guaranteed to be optimal in terms of the number of moves taken to win the game, let's say, it's not even guaranteed to be complete. <laughs> It's not even guaranteed to be complete. Because, why? Because there's a beautiful word that I'll throw at you and you should use this to impress all these other people who didn't come to the class. And they will be anybody. Okay. Ergodicity. Ergodicity. Say that and then look very meaningfully at them. They will change their <laughs> Okay. What is ergodicity? Who knows what is ergodicity? Ergodic word is a fancy name for a word where you won't die even if you screw around. The, what is wrong with death? Unless you believe in some happy religions where death is just one more step and then you'll continue living. Um, death is a trap door. <laughs> it's a one-way trap door. You go in, you don't come out. Search spaces can have one-way trap doors. You can basically get to this node because lots and lots of nodes will give, have this state as a child node, but this guy has no children. So that would be a trap search node. If you ever get into it, you're dead. There is the goal. I see the goal, but I'm dead. I'm in the last two play. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If you do online search, you can die. By the way, whenever you're crossing Mill Avenue, Rural Avenue, etc., do you think they're ergodic or non-ergodic words? <laughs> Ask the poor guys who have, once in a while get run over by cars, and they think they are just only talking on the cell phone while bicycling. Um, these are all non-ergodic words. So in particular, the, the definition of ergodicity is given any pair of states in the world, there is non-zero probability of going from one state to the other state. Any pair of states. It's a beautiful definition. If that is the case, then death state cannot exist. Because death state to any other state, there's only one way travel. There is no other way travel. In non-ergodic domains, Online search is not even complete. Word is non ergodic. You may still have to do online search. And it's worthwhile remembering all this. So you notice how games sort of open up the entire, you are nice and happy, thinking deterministic, static world, nothing is going wrong, and then you started games and everything went wrong. Okay? That's what we're keeping all this up. Okay, now we actually play not against people, but against nature. You can play against nature. Okay, before I go forward, let me ask you the following question. If you don't know which people you're going to play, I decide some person you get to play or nature you get to play against. And I'll decide the game. Which is a better game? Sorry. How many people think playing games against a person is better? How many people think playing games against nature is better? That guy is the only smart guy. <laughs> okay? Remember, I, I wish I could show you this. Remember that the family guy, Star Wars, that star thing I was telling you? They designed it for nature, man. They thought at most asteroids will hit, 
And what is the chance that a huge big death star asteroid will find its way to come and hit in that place? Extremely low. But Harrison Ford? <laughs> With box office to be made? 1.0 probably. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, there's a beautiful statement that you want to remember. Evolutionally, we have too big a brain. I understand most of the time you're depressed saying, oh, my brain is so puny. Okay, that's because you're comparing yourself to other people. People are bad. You compare yourself to people. Compare yourself to dogs. Elephants, huge big elephants. Dolphins. Whales. Compared to all of them, our brain size to our body size is ridiculously high. Most of our energy consumption is to keep our brain up. That was never a problem for dinosaurs. There's these huge big guys with a tiny little bird brain. Right. But you know where they are. Mostly in movies. You see what I'm saying? So the point I'm making is, evolutionarily, why did Humans have such huge brains. Is it to run away from the lions of Savannah or the tigers of Bengal? No. Deal with each other. Your biggest enemy is other people. Your biggest friend is other people, your biggest enemy is other people. So if you ever have a chance of playing against nature versus people, take nature. You know why? Nature is indifferent to you, despite all your religious upbringing, which might think that if you do the right number of prayers, nature will start working for you. That's how God will do. Nature doesn't even care that you exist. It will do what it does. So here is my point. Suppose I'm here, so suppose I have my max guy. There are three nodes, three, three things that can happen. This will happen with minus 10, this will happen with, if this happens, it will be minus 10, this happens, it will be plus 3, this will happen, this will be plus 7. For me. And if I'm playing against nature, and I computed some probabilities as to how often these things are happening. I might have found, oh, this is happening 0.1% of the time. This is happening 0.4. This is happening 0.5. So you can assume that even if you are playing, nature will still basically roll a three-sided coin and decide what will happen. It's not going to say, oh, Rav is playing. Let's get him. <laughs> Our Rav is playing, Rav is God's son, let's help him. No such thing. Rav is just one more boss. And I have my numbers. I just pass my point. You see what I'm saying? Whereas, these probabilities are useless if you are playing with a human. In fact, if you just looked at what humans have been doing a whole bunch of time, and come up with these numbers, and then you are playing against that human, they may still decide to do minus 10 with 1.0 probability when they are playing against you. Because they know that they are playing against you. They know that they don't like you. They know that they want to win, they want you to lose. So the probabilities will be thrown out the window and you take min. Which is why taking min when you are playing a game against the nature is being Paranoid. There is no such thing as being paranoid with people. Whatever paranoia you have, they are worse than that. They do even worse things for you. With nature, if you are essentially assuming, basically, even though these properties are there, you think, oh no, I know, that's for normal people. I'm such an unlucky person, minus 10 will happen to me. You're being paranoid. OK? If on the other hand, you think, you know, those are bozos, like, this is 0.5 plus 7, etc. But let's say, for example, um, this one, let's say, is 13. Then I'll say, 
uh, R here, this one is plus 10, I'll say that the good thing will happen to me, respect over what it's probably. Then I'm being delusional. You can be paranoid, you can be delusional, you can be rational, which is realize that these are the probabilities, these three things will happen, and what you can expect is expected return, which is probability times value plus probability times value plus probability times value. That's the expectation that you get. You see what I'm saying? That's what you do when you are playing games against nature. And here is a game against nature. In particular, games against nature involve stochasticity. That means you do a step, it may not necessarily have a single outcome, it might have multiple different outcomes with different probabilities. So now I'm playing against nature and now I'm going back to this simple game, where when you're playing against nature, you essentially assume that you're a single agent against the big bad nature. So think about this problem. This is a grid board, right? And I'm here. This is a very bad state. If I ever go in, I will never come out and I'll get a minus one reward. It's, if you're into religion, heaven or hell, one of those. Depending on your masochist or you know, say it. Okay? Um, and then the other one is plus one, which is terminal node with huge amount of positive return. But that's it, you'll never get out of it. Everywhere else, as you go through the nodes, as you go through the states, there will be little pokes. You still alive? You still alive? You still alive? <laughs> and I'll call those negative rewards, minus 0 0.04. Let's say in this particular problem, I just assume that it's minus 0 0.04. Okay? Uh, and terminal, and then you can get, get through. So if you come back to that state, you'll get one more poke. You still here? One more minus 0 0.04. But here, you can only go in once, you can't come out. Okay? Now, I'm here. I'm trying to figure out the sequence of actions I should make. For not act as if this is some generalization of path planning problem. Come next class, we'll realize that what we are looking at here is Markov decision process. Which, come, come, which basically is so general that it has many, many specializations, one of which is stochastic, shortest path problem. Okay? Imagine you're just trying to somehow get to the plus one as fast as you can. So you will die with a smug, happy face. Okay? The question then is what's the solution to this? This is A star search except for this new tech. Um, set up. In particular, if somebody says, here is the sequence of actions you are supposed to do, here is the sequence of actions you are supposed to do, then you should tell them you must be on drugs. Because here is the reason, I forgot to tell you one important issue, which is the thing that makes it stochastic is the actions don't have deterministic effect. So, here is a going up effect, going up action. So, whenever you are in a cell, you can go up, go left, go right, go down, when it's possible. In a normal deterministic search, you, when you go up, you go up to the next, the one that's up above. You go down, you go to the cell one below. Right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say there are probabilities involved. It's a cheap robot. When it tries to go up, with 0.8 probability it actually does go up. With 0.1 probability it goes left, 0.1 probability it goes right. It's not as cheap as your friend's robot, which also probably goes 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. That means it's also going backwards sometimes when it's trying to go forward. This is the stochasticity. Because there is stochasticity, if I tell you there is a sequence that's the optimal solution to this problem, you should laugh at me. Right? Because if I say, yeah, obvious, you want to go to class one, go up, 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 right, 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 and declare victory. What's wrong with that? 
Because when I said go up, I try to do up, I might actually go up or go right. Or go left, which means actually I'll be in the same set. Do you, do you guys see what I'm saying? So the solution for this problem is not a sequence of actions. In fact, the solution has to say, if you are in a particular state, what should be your move? That's what's called a policy. The solution for this problem would be a policy, which would sort of look like this, maybe. Um, for example, here is a policy. That's a policy. Do you guys see this? It's a reasonable policy. I can give you a bad policy if you want me to. Okay? For example, I will install this. That's a policy. That's going to die very fast. Ah, uh, something here, instead of this, I put it like this. That's another policy. That's a bad policy. So you see where you're going. First of all, instead of looking for paths, you are looking in terms of policies. Plus, you can talk about good versus bad policies. This just opens up wide open the whole idea of what it is that an agent is trying to do. An agent is trying to compute a policy. Plan or a sequence of actions is a special case. That makes sense when you have no stochasticity. Otherwise, you think in terms of policy. Now, having said that, we will talk about it in significant depth in next class. I'm sure if you started reading 17, this all of you know, chapter 17, you should, all of this should be making sense. It's just the way I came from game trees to this you may not have been seen, but you know, you kind of should make sense of this. But when I have these policies, when I set up these policies, I have two ways I could have solved this problem. One is I could just give you an offline computation algorithm. <coughs> That gives me a policy that is probably optimal. Just like A star search said, when I'm done, the policy, the plan I gave you, the path I gave you is probably optimal. Here too, I could have said, I will just write an algorithm which goes behind the doors, works, 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 comes out and says, here's your policy. Okay? And then if that is the optimal policy, then you never have to ask yourself, what should I do? Even though you are playing against the nature, you know what to do at each state. Because you computed the entire policy up front. That's offline computation of policy. That's what you started reading in chapter 17. And there are approaches, the standard approaches are value iteration and policy iteration. We'll talk about them when we come back. But today, I want you to think of mark quotation processes in terms of online computation. It's really a game, and computing the entire policy is too costly, many a time. I just want to know, what should I do now? And I'll do it, see where I get, then ask, what should I do now? You understand what I'm saying? This would be just like playing a game as a player, except this player, is nature. So who doesn't do win, but who does expectation for me. Agree? Okay? So this is how it looks. The same idea, online solutions for mark correlation processes, this is mark correlation process, which is a game against the um, game against the um, nature, right? So here is the way it looks. So I'm in let's say three two, where the heck three two is, so I'm in 3, 2, which is here, okay? And I can go left, or up, or down, or right. If I go left, if I go left from here, presumably, I will get to 4, 2 with 0.8 probability. I'll get to this node with 0.1 probability, which is going left of the direction I'm trying to go. Or I'll try to go to right with 0.1 problem. And the expectation in these games is that, in this kind of example, is that when you try to go in a direction and there's a wall, you stay in that place. It's a reasonable way. Okay, so 
Those are the three things that can happen to you. So you could have gone to 4, 2, okay, R3, 3, R3, 3, 1. By the way, 3, 2 actually is not this at all. It is this one. This one. And if from 3, 2, if you do go left, you will go to minus 1 state. If you go up, this is just a normal state, so you get a little poke. Say so you're still alive, minus 0 0.04 per year. Okay, and if you go this side, another four, minus zero point zero. Okay, so now we can talk about what are these values for this. These are game three notes. The values that I'm giving are the immediate rewards. Okay, but. I, if I don't have any better idea, I just take immediate reward of the state and say that's the evaluation function. If I have better idea, then I will compute some other evaluation function. Either which way, I can basically, if I have these numbers here, I can do backup to compute the values of each of these moves as far as the high upper guy is concerned. In this particular case, you will have to do expectation here, expectation here, expectation here, and see whichever is the value that's the highest, that's the note that you're going to pick. This is if you do one fly game tree, I mean two fly search, which is I do one step, nature does one step. If you want to do more look ahead, you can make this tree up to here, like five or six levels deep, apply the immediate rewards at the bottom, and again back. As you are backing up, you notice that all the intermediate nodes will wind up getting better and better values, which is different from their evaluation function values. So if you are smart and if you have a big hash table lying about unused, you remember this as the evaluation function. If you did this, you are doing something like what alpha goal does. It is computing the values of the intermediate nodes. So the question, of course, I already said this earlier, but you know, here I'm basically taking expectations. That's what I would do if I am a rationalist and I realize that nature is oblivious of my existence. If on the other hand, you think you are the chosen one, you think nature does the stuff that will benefit you. And if you are right, good. If not, evolution will lead you out. Right? And if you are the uh, paranoid one, you say, I am the loser, nature will do the thing that's the maximally damaging to me. If you are right, good. You will have a sad life, but you will still be alive. Right? And if you are wrong, then you just have a sad life. You could have had a happy life. <coughs> Nobody is out to get you, but you just assume they were out to get you. Okay? So, this, if you do basically this, so this would be min max, and you do min max if you in fact know 